Good afternoon, and a uh, big welcome to this year's Pemberton Lecture. And uh, it's great to have Deb Brash be here from, uh, from, uh, from London. And uh, there are going to be a lot of people online. So um, hello to you too. Um, before I get, um, uh, introduce Deborah, I want to uh, just say a few words about John Pemberton, who this lecture's uh, named after. So John was an epidemiologist who uh, had a long association with Sheffield, spent many years of his career here. And um, he, his uh, contribution was to think about the, so the social determinants of health. Uh, and he was one of the kind of uh, the founders of uh, social epidemiology in the UK. He was a pioneer of the importance of, of <coughs> understanding how uh, the determinants of health interact and cause ill health, particularly amongst people uh, in, in poverty. He did lots of work on nutrition, air pollution, and so on. Um, he's founded uh, with colleagues the International Epidemiological Association uh, and the Society for Social Medicine, which uh, many people in Shah who, are, who are, are members of, and also created the All Ireland Society of Social Medicine. So he really was a founder of many of the organisations now that promote social medicine uh, and, and epidemiology. Um, he worked with uh, people uh, who are leaders in the field, such as Archie Cochrane and Richard Dole, um, to found what we now know as public health medicine, academic public health medicine. So, in a sense, a lot of us here who do academic public health uh, owe our uh, careers to those founders back then. Um, Another reason I think why, why we particularly owe him a debt in Shah is uh, he's interested in, in inequalities and how poverty causes ill health. And that's still a strong theme we have today in Shah. So, and it's great to have Adam and family uh, from John's family here. So welcome. So now to uh, introduce Deborah. So as I said, she's, uh, she's come up from London. She's the director of the School of Public Health at Imperial. Uh, and she's uh, w a statistician who spent a lot of her career thinking about how we do trials uh, most effectively. And uh, she was a, uh, recently uh, one of the, the presidents of the Royal Society, uh, the Royal Statistical Society. <laughs> Just <laughs> promoted you. <so. laughs> um, and uh, we. Uh, uh, that's a, a, a post that's been, it's very prestigious and has been held by uh, lots of other famous statisticians who we'll be well, well aware of, like David Spiegelhalter and Peter Diggle, um, and even uh, Ron Fisher and Pearson back, back in the day. So um, I'd like to just hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. So the, just checking that my sound is doing what it should do and that I'm, have I, no, I haven't turned that on. Now is my sound doing what it should yes. do. <laughs> Can't trust these elderly professors. An absolute pleasure to be asked to, well, partly to come to Sheffield. I've not been up here for some while. I did spend some years as chair of the advisory board for the trials unit, but since I stepped down from that, I don't think I've been back up here. And in particular, to be asked to give the Pemberton lecture, um, which is about an absolutely eminent man. I'm stepping in the shoes of many eminent speakers, and although I won't be saying much more about him, I think it would be remiss not to at least mention that um, I, th I believe the first speaker was Sir Michael Rawlings, who many of you will know died sadly on New Year's Day this year, um, which was quite a shock to many of us, and he was certainly had a huge influence on my career, although I'm going to be contrasting John Pemberton with a very well-known lady. I actually think that you know, we could maybe in discussion, for those who know Mike, one might pick up some of what he did because I think some of what I got to say, there'll be some strands. But anyway, um, I must confess, I didn't know a huge amount about John Pemberton and I should have done. So I did a bit of reading round to think, you know, who, who is he, who was he? And the conversation I picked up, partly it picks up some points I want to focus on, and partly because it's a conversation that was with David Gunnell, who worked very closely with John Pemberton, and I worked very closely with, John, with uh, David Gunnell 
when we were doing drug regulation, looking at SSRIs and suicidality, which is one of the things David was an expert on. But I thought it was interesting. Just this, I mean, the whole interview is well worth reading if you don't know it. But he said, can you describe the path that brought you to epidemiology? Because he started life as a doctor. And people go in thinking, I'll deal with individual patients. I'll, well, all the students I taught in their first year thought they'd be making them better. And then they rapidly realised that that wasn't always possible, that you can do good things. But he did some very interesting things, um, was very politically aware. And he said that the epidemiology was motivated by a combination of his interest in medicine and his political interest. And he was influenced strongly by a handful of distinguished doctors who realised it required political action to remedy problems like malnutrition, bad slum housing and unhealthy conditions at work, which are the prerequisites for having a good healthy individuals, good healthy societies. And so he, like many epidemiologists, realised that although you can get so far by treating individual patients, of course that's absolutely essential, you could do more by standing back and looking, in his case it was tuberculosis, heart disease, cancer were the biggest, by looking at populations, the whole population, and seeing what difference is determined, for example, by income. And so he gradually took the view that he could probably do more good by that. And those again, and I know some of you know him very well, um, will probably know that he then turned that into action. So I thought that was a very nice parallel to and he lived from 1912 to 2010. I want to focus on Florence Nightingale, who lived almost exactly 100 years early, but as Steve Julius has told me numerous times and emailed me to make sure that I knew when he saw what I was talking about, has a very local connection. I thought, this is too good not to talk about Florence, who again is a very interesting character. Different people know her for different things. If you asked most school children, indeed their parents, they'd probably say yes, she, you know, she nursed the lady of the lab, but she was so much more. And her name is interesting because both parts of it are deeply symbolic. So this is a handwritten birth entry. She was born before the current UK uh, birth registration system. But her first name is Florence and that's because that's where her parents were when they had her. Um, her sister that we'll come to is called Parthenope, which is um, a variation of Naples. So, you know, this starts to give you some sense of the world in which she was born into. And it was registered and then sort of re-registered. So that was 1820. For those of you who know about registration certificates, this basically looks like the kind of thing you get now when you have to register a death and it's not very different except it's a different colour to what you get if you register a birth or indeed um, when people get married. And what this shows is that she died in 1910, very different generation, actually again interestingly signed off by somebody called Garrett Anderson who's daughter of the more famous Elizabeth Garrett Anderson but she was also a daughter so yeah she was a very well connected lady. But what I want to spend just a little bit of time looking at is her family tree. Now, I mean, I do my own genealogy, but there are some particular things I want to pick out from here. And if, so you'll see her down in the bottom left-hand corner, Parthenope, which is her sister in Florence. And she was the, well, they were both daughters of somebody called William Edwards, um, with first names. But if you follow that tree up, what you'll see is that by right, she should have been called Florence Shaw. Now, those of you who know this area might recognise the name Shaw, I believe, and Steve will tell you far more about it than I'm going, so I'm not going to parrot what he would tell you. But there's a Shaw Road, you've got, I believe, a student hall residence named after that family. It's a very important or very well-known local family. So why wasn't she called Shaw? Well, if you look further up, you can see that on her mother's side, there's somebody called Peter Nightingale, who lived in the 1700s. Peter Nightingale had two children, Anne, who married into the Shaw family, or at least whose daughter married into the Shaw family, and another Peter. And Peter was 
Well, I was thought he was childless until I started doing a little bit more research for this. Apparently, he did actually have an un, at least one unmarried daughter. Uh, sorry, uh, one, one daughter born out of wedlock. So she certainly didn't count. A, she was born out of wedlock, and secondly, of course, she wasn't a bloke. So Peter made his, this Peter the Younger made a lot of money with local industry, um, and he wanted someone to leave it to. So the deal was that if um, Florence's father changed his name to Nightingale, he'd get a lot. And this starts to explain the kind of rather nice lifestyle travelling that Florence enjoyed. I mean, I think that her father was not actually that bothered about running into industry or things, sold it, and I started to get, and if anyone's interested in your local history, there's, there's whole sort of journals, some of which seem to have streams of papers about the disputes between Peter Nightingale, uh, between the Nightingales and other people and who bought what, but I thought I'm not going to get sidetracked down there. But the important thing is that Nightingale as her surname actually signifies a really interesting family story. The other thing I just want to point you out to, and it's interesting on two counts, one is that um, Frances was the daughter of William Smith, who was an MP of some 40 years standing. You'll notice, actually, William's sister Mary, Mary Samuel, is also the son of William Smith MP, so clearly bro brother and sister, Mary, brother and sister. But what that meant, and we're going to see that Florence had a very good understanding of politics, uh, not always a great sympathy for politicians, and when you realise that her grandfather was, had been this you know, four decades as a politician, you begin to understand where she got that sort of deep understanding and connections from. So that was her basis. So what was her original life like? Well, this is a portrait from the National Portrait Gallery. And we've got Florence sitting down doing embroidery. And we've got her sister standing up. Her sister basically preferred sketching. And so that's her sketchbook in hand. So you can see the kind of life that the parents thought, you know, we've got money, we're going to attract a nice young chap, so we'll just make sure we've got some well-educated daughters. And her father was Cambridge educated, and, you know, what I think was relatively unusual in those days was not that he educated the, children, the girls at all, but the level to which he educated them. So she did Latin, Greek, history, philosophy, mathematics, modern language and music. A lot of people say, and they were saying to me, you know, oh, oh, she had a high training in maths, and she did. I think that was probably one of her preferred subjects. But actually, we're going to meet someone called Benjamin Jowett a bit later. Her Greek was good enough to help him with his translation of Plato's dialogues. I mean, you know, that's, I've got no Greek, I was in Latin. But that's a serious level of Greek, I believe. So Florence liked the education. But she was a little bit less keen on some of the other things. And from a young age, she was attracted to nursing. Now, in those days, nursing was not seen as a nice profession. I think from a parent's point of view, it brought you into contact with you know, poor people, people who were dirty, diseased. You know, and they just didn't want that for her daughter, for their daughter. And she said, when she asked if she'd go to nursing at Salisbury Infirmary, it was as if I wanted to be a kitchen maid. And she concluded, quite astutely, that only widowhood or poverty could give an educated, reasonable woman to work. And she was from a wealthy family, so she didn't have poverty, and I don't think she could be bothered to go the whole way to widowhood. So, yeah, she felt really stuck, and we'll see a little bit more of that. What she did do was she was also interested in education. And she went to what's called the ragged school, a ragged school. And I found a picture of ragged school, and if it wasn't the one she went to, it would have been very similar. So this was, I remember doing the 1800s for history at school, I found it an absolutely fascinating period. So many things, we had the Ed Education Act, which came in 1870. But we had philanthropists and other organisations trying to make education available. And you can see the kind of environment she was in, but again, her parents did not want their precious daughter going anywhere near that environment, thank you very much. Um, so they, so right, we'll, we'll knock that out of her, we'll, we'll take on a cultural tour of Egypt and Greece. And while she was on this tour, she visited a hospital orphanage and a school at Kaiserworth near Dusseldorf, 
which was staffed, it was a sort of quasi-religious education, and they had deaconesses who were trained by the pastor and his wife. And she went back in 1850, so by this stage she was, if I can do my son, was 30, and she went back and trained as a nurse, again, strong family opposition, they still weren't keen, but by this stage she was able to hold her own. But when she came back, she couldn't find an outlet for her training, and so she went, yeah, other people say, well, I'll go and do a bit more embroidery or translate a bit more Greek. No, she went on a tour of hospitals around UK and Europe, collecting information, the theme you're going to see time and time again, analysing and reflecting on the hospital reports and the government publications on public health. So she was interested, not quite so much in the how do you mop a fevered brow, but on, on the organisation of it. They then found her something suitable, the Lady Superintendent of an Institution for Sick Gentlewoman in Harley Street, which those of you who know London will know that's still one of the centres of private medicine. So that was okay. And she lasted about a year and a bit, and the Crimean War came up, and she was off. And that is what most people sort of know her for, for being the Lady of the Lamp. But actually, I mean, she did some things, I gather, by all accounts, she wasn't a brilliant good nurse. And of course, it may be that her parents sensed that actually maybe she was not the most practical of all people. It, you know, maybe it wasn't snobbishness that was getting her to do something different. Maybe it was, well, you know, it's really not your strongest suit. But what she did do, again, was collect data. She noticed that a lot of the men were dying not of war wounds, which you might expect in a war zone, but of infectious disease or other problems. And so she collected the data and did these graphs. And if you go to London any time and go into the Science Museum, to the Winton Gallery of Mathematics, there's several exhibitions, and one of them is the originals of these, isn't it beautiful? Um, but what these are is each of them is a wedge that shows, as you go around, the division of the number of deaths. So it goes July, August, September, October, right round to March, and then it dips over there and then goes April all the way round again. So each of these is a year. And what it shows is that the majority of deaths, those big sort of blue areas, are deaths from all the other causes. The, if I get this right, the, uh, the red ones are those that died from wounds, which is uh, what you, I mean, it's very sad, but it's what you expect in near battles. But it's a t those are a tiny proportion of deaths. And then the others, the black ones, are infectious diseases, which we'll come to for other reasons a bit later. So what she did was to illustrate very graphically what was going on, but she also introduced, um, or she talked to colleagues and they worked out how to, how to address it. And what you can see is that that circle is a lot smaller than that circle. And although it is only observational data, and with some of you I was discussing observational data, yeah, it's, it's a reasonable assumption that she may have done at least some things right to start to get the other deaths down. So <clears throat> what it illustrates is that she cared about data and organisation every bit as much as she did about actually being a nurse on the wards. And she came back and started working again. She was well connected. She started working with William Farr, who um, was one of, the, one of my predecessors as the president of the Royal Society, though not at this stage. And he set up the General Register Office. He was responsibility, responsible for the system we now have of civil registrations, birth death certificates. And what we have there is a copy of her nomination for the Royal Fiscal Society which certifies, there are several eminent people there, Babbage is another name that many of you may know, um, they certify that he is a fit person to be a fellow of the Royal Sister Society. We don't know for sure that this first woman, because one or two of the early books have been lost, but it's almost certain that she wasn't. If she wasn't, she's certainly the first one that anybody remembers. So, you know, she cared about data enough to make these connections and to then use that data, because yeah, although she got some, some maths training, she wasn't a fully fledged statistician by any means, but a lot of the good she did, she did by kind of motivating other people, and then actually kind of moving on. Very effective technique. But one of the things she did, which makes it such a joy to talk about, is she wrote copiously. She wrote, I think her collected works go to 20 volumes now. So whatever subject you're thinking about talking about, you can generally find something that she's had to say about it. 
I don't think she would have liked the word feminist. I mean, it didn't exist in those days anyway. But she was certainly a regular theme was she was really critical, firstly, of the education available to women and the limited expectations society had of their role. And she said, you know, the time has come, I love this quote, when women must do something more than the domestic hearth, which means nursing the infants, keeping a pretty house, having a good dinner and an entertaining party. Why have women passion, intellect, moral activity, these three, and a place in society where no one of the three can be exercised? And you can just feel the frustration. You know, she's articulate. I mean, there's nothing wrong with, I mean, I nursed infants, kept a house, I'm not sure it was pretty, but um, it, was, it was adequate, and I uh, was up for a good dinner and entertaining party. But you know, those are the add-ons to a, well, the children are, but the, the rest of it are kind of add-ons to a professional life not a substitute for it. So this frustration sort of bursts through in various ways, and so I put that photo up again because I think that's what she was kind of railing against. And I'm going to start interspersing this with how things are now, because I hope she would like what the Royal Society are doing. These are photos, firstly one from 2019, the first year of my presidency was pre-lockdown, and I spoke at a meeting that was organised by the Women in Statistics section, the Young Statistician section, and I think there were about three men in the room. Um, you know, women came out in droves. It was a really good occasion. Uh, Crystal Donnelly, who's my colleague at the moment, although she's going to be full-time in Oxford soon, because she's taking up being head of the Stats Department there. Um, she's the Vice President for External Affairs at the Royal Society. Jen Rogers, that many of you may know, was Vice President of External Affairs. She appeared on Watchdog. Um, and she's now a trustee of the Florence Nightingale Museum in London. And then... The last one is my close friend and colleague Jane Hutton, who's there in the sort of green and uh, brown and yellow stripy dress. And she, she was actually originally born, but she was born in South Africa and has maintains a very strong connection with Africa. That's going out to teach on AIMS, which is the African Institute for Mathematical Statistics. And although it is not women only, that is just such a joyful picture. I thought I pinched that, but I should make it clear that it's, um, yeah, I could have found for that one ones that were sort of gender balanced as well. So, yeah, I think, I mean, although we've still got more men than women in the society, certainly you can't miss some of the women who are there. So I think she would have enjoyed it. But she was, she sometimes known as a passionate statistician. She was passionate about a lot of things, actually. But she really had a deep view of statistics. You know, she's the most important science in the whole world. You can remember nothing else from this lecture. Remember that one. Um, because she thinks that the practical application of every other science and every art relies on it. It's the one science that's essential for political and social administration, all education, all organisation is based on that experience. And she's interested, she's very much about empirical things. She's not interested in you know, the finer points of statistical inference. I don't think she's ever calculated a p-value or confidence interval in her life, and she wouldn't do. But she is interested in collecting data and using it to make a difference. And I think, I hope, I, mean, I won't keep saying that, but I hope you can see some of what I understand John Pemberton was doing with collecting data and you, you know, being motivated. Of, well, how do we find out about this? What can we do? What data could we collect? How do we do it well? And then take it back. And early on, she was really interested in knowledge for knowledge's sake, but then she realised that that was a little temporary phase. She started being much more articulate about doing it to make good. So one of the many things she did, because she, she had supporters, I mean, she, she managed to get people with her, and she set up what's called the Nightingale Fund for the reform of civil hospitals, because she wasn't terribly keen on the way they were organised, and she wanted to establish an institute for the training of nurses and hospital attendants. Now, many women of, Francis, of um, Florence's class in education would then have spent the next couple of decades campaigning, going round, talking, you know, anyone involved in philanthropy at universities, you'll know what we mean here. No, she got them to do it while she did other things. So they went away and did the money collecting. She went on to campaign for a full commission of inquiry into the Crimean debts. Um, we sort of summarising what we saw on those um, coxcomb charts, 16,000 from disease versus only 4,000 from battle. So you know, she really thought this needed prop, you know, properly looking at. And she again, all of, I'm sure that all of these 
could make a whole story in its own right or a whole hour's lecture, but you know, she worked through <coughs> her connections and knew how to do things. But she was also passionate about education. Um, and she didn't seem to mind at what level she was working. She had a very keen interest in her village elementary school near the family home in Derbyshire. But equally, she had strong views on the education of schools in British colonies and education in workhouses for the poor. For those of you too young to know what workhouses are, it was what you did this was before the social security system. And if you were destitute, your parish, if you were of that, that's why the phrase of this parish comes about, you went in there and many people hate it because they felt they would never come out. I mean, my grandmother was hated the idea of going near hospital because the hospitals were the old workhouses. And there was that kind of East End fear of if you go in there, it's you're doomed. And um, but you know, they were the social security of its day. And common themes all the time about this education needs to be practical, it needs to be hands-on. You need manual skills. I mean, she managed to avoid manual skills most of the rest of her life, which is quite neat. But actually, she realised that other people needed that sort of training. And she had opinions about British soldiers and thought that one of the things they needed was a much better, more rigorous education. She was equally scathing of the army doctors. I mean, you might have thought that the army doctors had been through university and got some kind of education, but actually she thought they needed rather more. <clears throat> and when her supporters had raised this money, she was then back in there, sort of micromanaging the Nightingale School of Nursing at St Thomas's. Detailed instructions. It should be taught by practitioners. And again, if you're interested in that, it's worth looking at. You know, even things like each trainee nurse should have their own room where they can go and study. I mean, they're reminiscent of a new wolf in a room with one's own. Quiet room. I mean, you know, anybody here who is in a plan working uh, only dreams of such things now. But the interesting thing was that because this was done well and attracted good people in, as those graduates went nationally and internationally, they took her influence worldwide. You know, I went out and talked to Australia and I touched on Florence Nightingale there and um, yeah, I looked up and found pictures of something in Sydney where four of her nurses had gone there. But the education that I haven't heard too much about is somebody called Alex Atwell had clearly done some research on it and has published papers. So again, there's a lot more detail in that. But it's a, and it's, it's not just a sort of, you know, a five-year thing. It's absolute strand of what she cared about. Um, I've said that she thought the point of education is to teach men not to know but to do, and that it should be about observation. Then it tells how the patient is, but reflection then tells us what's to be done, and training tells us how to do it. So there's, if you like, three parts of the stool. So you know, some epidemiologists who just collect data to see, oh, yeah, did you know that people who come from this socioeconomic group are doing worse than those? You say, yeah, well, we've known that. I mean, that, that was reasonably well known when I did my PhD. It was well known back then. What are we doing about it? And it's the other two parts that motivated her. And I love that last quote, every five or ten years really requires a second training nowadays. I mean, if I suddenly could only get a set of data, I'm sure I could analyse it, but my goodness, I'd have, I mean, I've, yeah, I've used Fortran and SPSS and SAS and S, which some of you might remember was the forerunner of R. I mean, I can learn a new language fairly easily, but my goodness, I would have to relearn. And when it comes to artificial intelligence, um, other than realising actually to a large extent it's statistics spelt differently, um, yeah, I would, if I was to do it seriously, I would have to go and do some serious study. So I think that's a very good observation. You tend to think that's a modern phenomenon, but actually, you know, she noted it. Now, I said that her grandfather was a politician, and I'm assuming that she spent time meeting politicians and hearing her grandfather talking about politicians. And she corresponded regularly with Benjamin Jowett, who um, was again, well, like many people of his generation, he was clergy, but also an academic. And he became the head of uh, Balliol College at Oxford. And she wrote to him, our chief point was the enormous amount of statistics at this moment available at the disposal of the MPs, or in their pigeonholes, which means not at their disposal, is almost absolutely useless. Why? Because the cabinet ministers and their flunkies um, haven't, you know, they've had a university education, but they have not been taught 
I'm paraphrasing slightly, how to cope with data and statistics. And we must do something about that. And I just love the idea that you know, everything they need to work out what the problems are and to work out what might need doing about it are just in dry and dusty pigeonholes. And I'm old enough that I certainly had those kind of pigeonholes with, with stuff in it for quite a large chunk of my career these days. It's almost empty apart from one to RSS magazines. So she offered to pay. You know, remember she comes from a wealthy family. She had money. She proposed introducing statistics into studies at the University of Oxford by setting up a professorship of applied statistics. She wasn't thinking of in the maths department. This was in the politics, the PPE department. And what she wanted to do was to address the need for statistics related to edu education, prisons, workhouses, and India, which is another one of her passions. I'm not sure she actually spent much time there, if any, but she was certainly passionate about it. And they were rude to her. They didn't want that. I think they said something along the lines of, well, how about a nice little essay prize? So they didn't get their chair, and I think it was many years later that University College had the first chair of applied statistics, which she didn't pay for. So what's our equivalent? You may be looking, thinking, I don't have a pigeonhole like that. I mean, that's not my problem. Anybody got a phone that looks like that? Yes. <laughs> and it comes in, what I can't cope with is stuff coming in on different streams. Yeah, sometimes the kids are email and friends are on WhatsApp. My sister-in-law doesn't use that, but it comes, I mean, that's not data, but it comes in, she's still using Messenger, so I have to keep Messenger open, because it's the only way of keeping a line of communication with her. And then there's your personal email and your work email. And apart from, I mean, data should not be sent around email, but um, certainly in institutions I'm associated with, it happens. But you, know, you look and think, how do I access this? And these days, it's got about 20 passwords. So getting into it's a nightmare. And so I think we've got the same issue of overwhelm. And at least for the politicians, um, I'll, I won't comment on academics, we've also got the same problem that even if they have the time and could work out where it is, what would you do with it? How do you work it out? And one of the things the Royal Society did was to publish what they called the Data Manifesto, and they did one in 2014. Third version was 2019. And they do this when there's an election. And what they do is write to all the candidates and say, who of course at that stage of their political careers are really keen to you know, cosy up to anybody who will be nice to them. And what the RSS say is, will you sign up that if you are elected, you'll come to some training courses that we're laying on? And lots of them sign up. Relatively few come, but I mean, a fair number do send their researchers. And it's got 10 recommendations to the UK government on how it can improve data policy making, democracy, and the pros prosperity of society. And basically says, I mean, what Florence Nightingale was saying years ago, politicians and policymakers and others in public services, including regulators and, and the rest, should, so Michael Rawlings would like this one, because uh, he spent much of his career on regulation and was indeed himself an accomplished and passionate statistician, um, they should give him better training in data handling, statistics and interpreting evidence. Oh, got the wrong way. And what I love, I mean, I'm little bit of mix and match here because this was for another purpose but in the first year of the pandemic Florence had her bicentenary and that was what I was president of the Royal Society over that period so one of the reasons I was doing a lot on Florence Nightingale was I was getting a lot of invites to talk and it was a yeah she's a great person to talk about and St Thomas's Hospital is just across the river from the House of Commons and to celebrate the Bicentenary, they projected out. I wish I'd known. I live very close to there and I could have walked along. But I just love the idea of Florence kind of looking at the politicians and saying, Okay, what are you up to now? Um, I mean, she's there as a nurse and that was their main focus, but we can interpret that in other ways. And again, if you want another quote, you know, the main end of statistics should be not to inform the government how men have died, but to enable immediate steps to be taken to prevent the extension of disease and mortality. And I think her thinking, and indeed other people, I mean, she wasn't the only person thinking like that, but I hope she would have liked or approved of some of what happened during the pandemic. And I should say, I'm director of a school of public health in Imperial, where we went into COVID 
action very fast, um, partly because Neil Ferguson, my colleague, leads the infectious outbreak modelling. And so they, yeah, they'd already looked at Zika, Ebola, but also malaria. So when a new disease was spotted, they, yeah, he was working on January the 1st or 2nd when the first case was spotted and was doing modelling. And their reports certainly, I mean, people have, to have their own views about whether they should have done or not, but they certainly influenced government early on. Because early on, you don't have the empirical data. You, you're doing some what-if and scenario planning. Later on, you can collect data and you can cheek it. Um, and from that, we set up the Nightingale Hospital. And as it happens, we didn't need them terribly much. But I like the idea, clearly, again, they were named after her because she's a nurse, but I like the idea that they were set up because data projected that we might be going to need them and the virus wouldn't have had to have many different characteristics and we might well have done. I mean, they're all stepped down now and returned to their previous functions. And I was heavily involved in the REACT studies, other people have been involved in the ONS studies, and so this is, so we were collecting data every month <coughs> It was coming in over the weekend, seeing a draft on Monday, full draft on Tuesday. The government got it then, and by Thursday, it was in the public domain. I mean, those of you who do epidemiological and observational data, that, when I think how many months and years it took us to do other analyses, this was a phenomenal and really quite scary pace. But you know, nobody wants a paper that's three months old in a pandemic. So we had to learn a very, very different way of thinking, and we're still now more nature medicine and science and other journals to my name than I've ever had because of course we're now doing some of the canonical publications documenting it more thoroughly but this is one looking at the swab test just coming up to the Christmas that we then went back into lockdown it looked like it was all kind of going away those are the different regions up there but when we looked at the maps and that was so this was very much a regional survey of England um, when you looked at the maps, you just start to see some dark coming up down in Kent, which was what was known as Kent variant, and of course that was what changed everything. So that was again collecting data for a purpose, which is very different to the other kind of epidemiology I've done. Um, I've spent much of my life doing trials, so it would be remiss of me not to mention trials. And um, again, the interesting question here is how did all of this happen so fast? Because the first patient was really identified sort of sometime in early January. You know how long it takes, those of you in the trials unit, and those of you are new to write a grant and get it and go through ethics. And I'd certainly been involved on a data monitoring committee for a pandemic a flu, a pandemic flu that I completely missed the boat. These were up and running, recruiting from the 3rd of April, that year, not a year later. And one of them was in primary care patients, and I chaired the data monitoring committee for that as principal. One of them was recovery that I suspect most of you have heard about, which is patients in hospital. And then remap cap was in patients in intensive care. And the answer is that remap cap was already running for hospital pneumonia. And so what they did was to add extensions that covered COVID. <coughs> recovery was, again, from a trials unit, there's great big trials. And principal built on um, the reason I chaired the data monitoring committee for this was I'd already chaired it for Alice, which was the flu pandemic trial. So all of them were building on a huge infrastructure and knowledge of how to do platform trials. <coughs> and these really did, and I hope Florence Nightingale will approve, they fed back in because Principal has recruited just shy of 12,000 patients. Most This was looking at existing medications and repurposing them. Most of them, the red are those that have stopped for futility. The green, in healthy is which is an asthma treatment, is the only one that has stopped for benefit. And the last three treatments, they've now stopped recruiting, but they're still in follow-up, so the answers aren't in the public domain. For recovery, that's still recruiting. They've recruited, I mean, I have to check this, within a week of giving a talk, because the numbers change so fast. They've recruited over 48,000 patients, and again, I won't run through them, but the hydroxychloroquine and so on were stopped for futility, and the green ones are the ones that worked. And again, they've got several randomizations still going. And remap cap, phenomenal, 18,000 randomizations in intensive care. And they've got multiple randomizations going on across all of the different things they're admitting. They've got 61 current or completed across 17 domains. 
and they rapidly learned that some things worked and some things didn't. So you know, if we're feeling reasonably complacent about COVID now, it's partly about vaccines, which it was also interesting questions about being prepared, but it's partly because these trials set up and learned rapidly, ditch the ineffective treatments, which are a waste of money and not very good for patients, and learnt about what the new patients were and then they became standard of care. So absolutely phenomenal. Um, the RSS got involved in all sorts of things and Sylvia Richardson, who was the president-elect at that time and David Spiegel's past president, set up a COVID task force that I asked them to do and they became the kind of the point of people asking for help, they went there with React, they basically acted as referees for us over the weekend. They gave us really good feedback because this, you know, it didn't go through peer review, there wasn't time, and they got involved in all sorts of other things. And some of you may remember, you know, you get involved in all sorts of things as statistician you don't expect to. Remember the A-level debacle, um, where they knew that the students couldn't be sitting the exams. They'd come up with an algorithm, people had pointed out that the way they were doing it was likely to lead to biases that privileged the more well of students and not the others and they went ahead, and so we spoke out. I had to sign a letter um, that went in, and off call got a bit um, nasty, so we had to tell them about it. And we also got very vocal, and I did a report with John Deeks on the um, mass testing, because they went hell for leather, and it's no bad thing, but they rode roughshod over good ways of evaluating things. In the long run, that's always dangerous. So we have to keep saying, you know, these are the things that matter. It's no good how it does in the laboratory. You want to know how it works in populations. Again, I can hear from Alice Nightingale, but we're saying, yeah, of course you do. Um, so, lots of things, and I hope there are some themes there we can pick up in discussion. What about her legacy? I mean, clearly, the first, there's a double entendre here, because clearly the first legacy was the legacy that she got from, or her father got from Peter Nightingale, that without that, I don't think she would have been as effective as she is now. I'm sure she'd done some useful things, but that underpinning and travel and connections helped her enormously. Benjamin Jarrett, the chap who was running Balliol, wrote to her and said, oh, this was, this was New a New Year's Eve letter, great deal of romantic feeling about you 23 years ago when you returned from the Crimea. Now you work on in silence and nobody knows how many lives you've saved and um, you know, how many natives of India, that was the language they used then, um, in this generation, generations can be preserved from famine and oppression by the energy of a sick lady who can hardly rise from her bed. The world doesn't know about it, think about it, but I know and often think about it. And the more I read that, the more I think of a patronising man. Because what really needed me was when I did my sum, sums and realised that in 1879, Florence was 59, which was younger than I was when I was doing this talk. But that's not an old lady. I mean, I know that there's been a bit of a shift, but... So anyway, he died in 1890-something. 1906, Florence still going strong. She doesn't die till 1910. And I love this picture. You know, and she was, I perhaps didn't say, she came back from Crimea, and whether it was a physical illness or post-traumatic stress, what it was, she basically became a hermit. So she achieved all of this, not by going round and having dinner parties, but by writing, 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 which is why we've got such a nice legacy of her words. And she outlived him, and she looks to me, I just love that picture. And during lockdown, when I was, I don't get down easily, but I was living on my own and running a big department, and, and I was thinking, how are you meant to cope? And I saw that, and I thought, Look at what she did from her room, and it kind of, it gave me some strength. Um, so she was my lockdown role model. And I want to finish by returning to John Pemberton's legacy, legacy because I hadn't realised that he'd been involved in the International Epidemiological Association, or society, which I haven't had so much to do with. But when I was a, a wee young postgraduate, Society for Social Medicine was very much our society. I went in 1981, that was the very first presentation I ever did in a conference, um, because I'd worked at the Royal Free and Austin Heady, who's the sort of fairly tall chap with some quite dark glasses, sort of, sort of in the middle at the back, um, by then looked rather different because his hair was greyer, and he was the reader, along with Stuart Pocock and other much younger people, and he got us to go, you know, that you, know, you must go to Society for Social Medicine. And then <coughs> three, three years later, four years later, 1985, I went to the Liverpool meeting, um, fairly pregnant at the time actually, and then 
A year late, later, when I went up to Liverpool for an interview for a lectureship, Peter Farrow, that some of you may know, um, said, I know you, I chaired your session at Sox Up Med in Liverpool last year. And I mean, I think I've probably got the job anyway, but it certainly helped. So certainly Society of Social Medicine has had an influence or been, you know, played a, a pivotal role for me as well as many other people. So I think the two of them, they lived at different times. They dealt with things differently. I've no idea if they would have got on or whether they'd have clashed madly, but I think there's a lot in common about people who see things a bit differently and who use data to actually make a difference. So, unless I'm very much mistaken, yes, I'm stopping there. And, um, but I'm happy to take whatever questions. I know people in this audience know far more about Florence and certainly her local connections, and I suspect many other aspects. But um, I hope there are some themes there that we, we might talk about. just really great to kind of reflect on these pioneers mm -hmm. to whom we owe so much of a debt and uh, Florence Nightingale and of course John Pemberton are two uh, people very much who uh, did all that pioneering work mm -hmm. uh, which is the kind of foundation of what we do now so thank you <coughs> so we've got time for questions and who would like to begin mm -hmm. oh thanks huge amounts of things I, I didn't know. And in response to your invitation to maybe open it up, talk a bit more about some of your themes, I guess the one that really interests me is role models. Yes. You know, of all the ways in which people leave a legacy, you know, it's, it's that. And, and I guess as you were talking and I was reflecting on these people, and think in academia there's lots of people who are very brilliant and lots of people who are very passionate, mm -hmm. but what makes them a role model? It's a brilliant question. So for those online who may have just caught some of that, the question is that we've got two people we've talked about who are role models. And the question is, what makes a good role model? And I think it partly it's personal integrity, doing good science, caring. I mean, for some people it's about education or health. For other people it may be about something quite different. But I think if I think about these two, they went about leaving their legacy in very different ways. Florence was, to a very large extent, a loan operator, and what she did was make high power connections that she brought on board as and when she needed them. But she was also motivating people to, get, you know, to go and earn money, or to raise money to set things up. And if I've understood John Pemberton correctly, again, what he did was bring people together. He had a discussion group. Um, he named it, and I believe he said this will be the British Association of Epidemiology, and someone else from Dublin said, uh, could we drop the British, please? And he immediately said yes. So it's like bringing people together um, and then actually inspiring them, but actually letting other people do it, because in the end, if you do it all yourself, then it's no use. And certainly I'm at a stage of career, um, I may be a little bit older than Florence, but I've got a long way to go before I get to her age. But I'm more concerned, you know, my legacy I regard as the people the PhD students I've had, or people I've taken on as young lecturers who are now doing things that I couldn't do. And that's not me being modest, they've built on what other people are doing. And in the end, that's a much bigger legacy than any one piece of work that I've done, or even, a, you know, even the React papers or the clinical trial stuff. It's In the end, it's about people. So for me, that, and it's how they work with them, and there's all sorts of different ways of doing that. But it's, um, but I, and I suspect, if you think about someone who's a good role model, at some point there'll be an element of how do they inspire you and how do they get groups of people to work together because that's a real skill. Um. Yes, I mean a, a personal reflection is I, I, you probably don't remember but I actually met you when I was an MRC fellow on a, on a fellowship back in about 20, 2009 right. and uh, I was trying to retrain myself from being a public health uh, person to a statistician. We like that. Which was, uh, <laughs> we like those. And, um, <laughs> And you were just so encouraging about what I was doing. So, uh, yes, I'm sure you've inspired a lot of people yourself. Was I on the panel then, or was I? No, this was no. A, an MRC event that oh, okay, yes. for, for fellows. Yes. And, yes. Uh, yeah, we were talking about our work, and, yeah. and you were just very encouraging. Oh, good. Well, thank you. Because with that kind of work, you don't often know what you've done or not done. I guess I've bored other people and needled other people. But it's when you have someone come back and say, actually, what you said then mm. has an effect. Oh, that's 
But that's probably so thank you for that. More questions? And when I'm giving, so this is um, Steve Goodaid, you're asking that if we're thinking about this through the lens of impact case studies. Apologising. <laughs> he, he did apologise, but that's fine, it's a good question. And I mean, actually, the, the reason, you know, the challenge is it's very easy to use people like Florence, and I'm sure sometimes people like John, as spokespeople for what we now think, which I was careful to say, I don't think she'd like being a feminist. But you're asking really, what are the evidences that what she did resulted in change? I suspect, I mean, I, that if a historian looks at it, they'd be looking at who did she influence, what happened, could other people have had an influence? And I suspect some of these things, lots of people are thinking about it, and sometimes one person gets the credit. But I, and I suspect some of it would be quite specific. I think the death in Crimea war, what else did you list because I should drop the crime here, but I think there's a lot of things that start there. Whereas I suspect that scouting off about education and workhouse in India, yes, she spoke about it, she was passionate about it. I'm not sure we can look back and say that's what she did or said that made a big difference, except she might indirectly have influenced somebody else. Um, and she failed as well. I mean, that's the other thing. She didn't get her own way all the time. <coughs> Oxford, sir. Um, Shame for not picking up her a good idea. Can I just ask you, um, you mentioned COVID and the, yes. the role of the, the Ferguson work at the beginning. Yes. Now, statistics can become very, very political, can't they? Yes. And I know that the RSS has done some, some work. I don't know if you want to comment on how statisticians or, or academics in general should, should kind of approach the uh, working with political leaders. No, I think that's a really good question. I think I'm going to generalise slightly to look at the whole area of science advice, because of which data and statistics play a huge role. But so I think I'm, what, what I'm saying applies to other science advice as well. And I, I mean, when I did drug regulation, I did that for two decades. We sat on a committee, and for a long while I appeared from time to time as a one chaired by Michael Rawlins. By the time I joined it, his successor, I was separate committee had taken over. And it was very clear that we gave our advice, we had three conversations, but that anything that was said publicly went out as a committee. It was cabinet decision making. Um, I've got a journalist wanting to talk to me about the Rosie Glitter Zone story. And I said, I will talk to you in general, regulatory capture is the project that they were involved in. I said, I will talk to you in general how these things worked, but A, I was under confidentiality agreements, and secondly, I can't remember the detail that far back. You have no idea how many products we saw on a monthly basis. So I think there, there was a structure we fed in, we expressed our view. Now, where, and I've listened recently to, um, uh, I've forgotten the name of the radio series. Well, no, the, the, the music, well, and it's like Desert Island Disc, except it's classical music. At any rate, uh, David Nutt, who's actually a colleague of mine, was introduced. Now, David Nutt, you may remember, because he chaired the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs. He said to the government, look, these drugs are not as dangerous as you think. You're mad to make them Class A. And he was sacked. Mike Rawlins had chaired that perfectly successfully for 10 years. I think in parallel with starting up NICE. Mike said the same thing. What would Mike would say was, from a medical point of view, our assessment is this. However, of course, the decision on classifications is down to politicians, and they will need to take into account other considerations. I mean, basically said exactly the same thing. The evidence says this, but he knew where to have the line between what a scientist says and what a politician says. It's a difficult one. I think it's particularly difficult in pandemics when things are absolutely motoring. And I think, whereas before SAGE had met and increasingly met on other major issues, and this had never come, this, and they, they take the very best people who, of course, are speaking out, of course, the radio interviews, and it's a delicate one. But I mean, certainly the advice I would have is it's better to get involved and try and work out how to, because if good scientists don't get involved and say, well, I don't want to be accused of cozying up to you know, 
and the current political party or the opposition or whatever, then actually they were just relying on the people. So, um, so I mean, that, I hope there's some context. I don't want to particularly comment on the details of a, a particular colleague's interactions, but I think that's the general principle, and, um, and different people handle it and navigate it differently. More questions? So the question is, what can we learn from the COVID trials about setting them up and having them more rapidly? And I think there's probably two things. One is the need for rapidity. I'm not sure that everything needs to be done at that pace. I mean, it, in a pandemic, it absolutely did. We needed those answers, and we needed them yesterday. There is a price. I mean, those in the trials unit will know that many trials got put onto ice. They couldn't recruit. And the NHR, for example, is now going through an exercise of which of those are worth investing more in to get finished and which of those are past their sell-by date because otherwise there's a backlog that gets in the way of future work. So you can't accelerate everything, but there's certain things you can. But I think what you can do is have good structures. So I had, I'm a fellow of the Academy of Sciences and back in 2019, we'd had a meeting, they, they had something called the forum, which is interaction of industry, uh, regulators and academic life, which had looked at platform trials, what were the barriers, and we'd had some examples. There were good dementia trials. There's the, um, there are one in prostate cancer, which Matt Sides does. So we've got a lot more experience about how to do platform trials. So we had that knowledge and expertise that we then rapidly put into action. So my, I think my advice is we should look. Platform trials don't sort every disease, but they certainly sort a lot. And they were what I mean, they weren't called platform trials then, but they were what changed the survival for childhood leukemia because they basically had a nationwide protocol that you went in and when they learned that something worked, that changed and everyone, if you wanted treatment in the UK, you went into an experiment and it changed the survival from something like 10% to 90%. Phenomenal story. Um, so I think for, in general, we should think when is that kind of thing appropriate and when do we do the boat this boats trial? What it means is we've then got some learnings that when we do need to get our skates on, we can do that and say so there have been some learnings and haven't worked brilliantly for the pandemic, uh, for the influenza pandemics, but there have been some learning and thinking which was then activated. And it's also like anything else, and I believe, I've never worked in a hospital, but I believe they have, you, know, you don't just have a response plan of what do you do if there's a train crash near Paddington, as there once was, what do you do if there's um, a major pandemic, but you also should rehearse those. And I believe one of my friends, Dustition, was statisticians in the Paddington train crash and they'd had a rehearsal not very long before and apparently it worked really smoothly. I'm not just given a number but you've escorted through the system by a member of staff and it swung into action. It's not a surprise these things are going to happen. But it's, um, yeah, but generally just being really good. It's a slightly lengthy answer but um. we've got uh, time for That's a good question. So it's one thing lobbying MPs, but the question is what can we do more generally as public health people, statisticians for decision makers and, and um, other people in the public domain. So one of the things the Royal Society did, and I was involved for a while, was to run courses for journalists. It's something Sheila Bird actually set up because we used to have something called Forsooth in our magazine that picked up these you know, funny things and when they got it wrong, so that's not very well, but what we need is good examples and to build relationships. And we had some sort of bite-sized things where journalists were invited in in quite small numbers. And they could ask, and they could say, well, I don't really know what an odds ratio is. I don't know. What it meant was that then they, what began to happen was that as they got data in, they, they began to get wise about what questions to ask. Or there was somebody that actually, you know, they're not going to bite my head off. I'll get on the phone. And I think at a greater level, the Science Media Centre does that now. And it builds relationships and gets people asking questions because journalists work under 
enormous time pressures. So I think one of the questions is what can you be doing with other, so that the media is important because they mediate new stories, but you could work with other decision makers, you could do something locally, and perhaps have something to say, we're happy to run training course number three, people could drop in. But you know, to say to them, what, what would you find helpful? And you don't need really complicated examples, you need something to get the conversation going, actually. And I think you'll find far more journalists now as a result of that asking questions about, well, what was the rate? So we're asking everyone to risk is this, but you know, what was the absolute rate? So they've learned to ask those questions. But it's, and again, it's, it's like the science advice, it's being engaged, and it always takes time. Um, I've got, a, you know, been asked to go and talk to a BBC journalist to talk to some colleagues on Thursday. I'm thinking, oh, that means I've got to read something and think about what to wear and blah, blah, blah. But actually, you know, that's, and on this one, I think I probably am as good a person as any to go and talk. So sometimes you just need to find the time. Um, but yeah, but you know, you, I'm sure you live with your public health people. I don't think you had Greg Fell last year. So yeah, just say to them, what would you find helpful? So we've got time for one more, one more question. So the RSS doesn't train, I mean, I think NICE have had a lot more statistical input than and certainly more than drug regulation has had in the past. Um, the RSS doesn't play a direct role in training people, but what it has done is sometimes then, particularly in the they've had meetings where when statisticians were doing and they were often quite big, complicated meta-analysis, because the data NICE work with is, is not the NICE tidy trials a lot of the time, they then had academic meetings, published so people come together and discuss it, so it became the place that people could discuss what they were doing and other people could understand what was going on. So I think it's that more than anything else. I mean, behind the scenes, I'm sure, well, they've been lobbying about drug regulation. I think they, because Mike Rawlings was asked to chair it, they didn't need to lobby about whether statisticians need to be involved in NICE. And then the problem, yeah, I think that there, you're the logistic problems of how they do it. I mean, you know, John, who's sitting there very quietly pretending that he's retired, um, <laughs> will know more, far more about what was commissioned for, this is John Nichols for those who can't see him. Um, you know, they have to commission research and it's, it's a lot of work. But I, I think, yeah, so I think the has played a role, but I think it didn't need to play the, the, such a role in that as it does in some other places that are much more still statistician three zones. Thank you very much, and uh, uh, again, let's... Uh... <laughs> um, so there's a, a drinks reception outside, um, and for those people online, I'm just going to... Uh, uh, so if you've been online, thank you for joining us, and uh, uh, the, we'll also be uh, releasing the video um, uh, to, to watch later. Thanks. <laughs>